All right, you will be happy to know that this is going to be a short lesson. There's just a couple things that we need to go over with regards to photographing the crime scene. So we're talking about crime scene photography. We have already touched on this in a previous lesson, so I'm just going to expand just a tad. So investigators must work against the clock to document evidence. So they've got to make sure that a record of evidence in its original form is captured. And a lot of times this is done through photography. Now in a previous lesson, I told you that um, when the forensic investigators came to speak to my class last year, uh, one of those students questions was about how many photographs do you take at any given crime scene? And the investigator said that on average, they take 3000 pictures per crime scene. So that's just an average, 3,000 pictures. So that documentation via photography is important to investigators. So factors such as location, weather, the time of day, um, whether or not it's a business that has to get back to, um, get back to work, all of these things affect time that investigators can spend at a crime scene. Sometimes they have the luxury of, you know, taking as much time as they need. Like if it's a climate controlled building that doesn't require people in and out, that is what we would call a luxury crime scene. Whereas if you have like a hospital, a crime scene that is part of a hospital or an outdoor crime scene and there's a storm rolling in. All of those factors can affect how much time investigators have to photograph a crime scene. So they have to be trained, they have to work quickly and efficiently. Remember evidence can be has to be preserved until it can be photographed. We know photographs are important because they provide documentation or reference. A lot of times it's showcased in trials in court for jurors to have reference. Um, and oftentimes those photographs are used to help solve crimes and make sense of events that surround crimes. So the crime scene first has to remain unaltered. The only exception is cases where there are injured people that need attention, but careful attention has to be paid to keeping the crime scene unaltered as much as possible. Sometimes accidents do happen. So if an investigator kicks a weapon or steps on a weapon as they're moving across the floor, um, that happens. It's real life, but all of that should be noticed, noted in the final crime scene report. If objects are moved or positions change, or items are tampered with, the evidence might not be admissible in court. A great example of this is with the Stephen Avery case. If you have watched Netflix's Making a Murder, um, one of the things that they showcase in that documentary is they pull up crime scene photography of an area where a crime occurred. And then later, there are photographs of keys that are in that location. And the significance of these keys is they have the suspect's DNA on them or the victim's DNA on them and they belong to the suspect. Uh, but when you go back to older photographs from the initial search of the crime scene, those keys are not in those photographs and then they appear in future photographs. And so that was a big deal in that case. Um, and that's a great example of when investigators or when um, attorneys start to present this information to jurors in the court of law, jurors are looking for these inconsistencies. All right, so crime scenes should be photo photographed, should be photographed as completely as possible. So photographs of the following should be made. Um, so the entire area where the crime took place, also adjacent areas. So investigators have to think outside the box. Um, entry points and exit points also have to be photographed from both sides. So if you're photographing uh, a home, entry points on the outside and exit points on the outside um, and, 
and vice versa on the inside of the home as well. Overview photographs, so the entire crime scene as an overview and then specific locations, close-ups, um, far off, the body if there's a victim. Um, lots of photographs has to be made of a victim and then specific pieces of evidence. Investigators have to use proper techniques. They have to be trained when they photographed evidence. So a couple of housekeeping rules when taking pictures at a crime scene, an item of scale has to be in the picture. Now this can be a ruler, a quarter, something that everybody's familiar with and they can use it as a size reference. Most of the time investigators on their evidence placards will have a built-in ruler. Um, each piece of evidence must be photographed at three different angles and three different distances. So each piece of evidence, three different angles, three different distances, that's a total of nine, at a minimum for each piece of evidence, nine different photographs. Of course, investigators are going to take more than that. They've got to have those close-up shots, mid-range shots, and long shots, and they want to try to capture the evidence placards um, in those pictures. Now, as physical evidence is discovered, or could be biological evidence is discovered, the evidence is photographed um, show that, so that it can um, be represented in court to show position and location relative to the entire scene. All right, I told you that would be a fast lesson. Um, so that concludes today's topic, and I will see you in the next lesson.